Good morning. Welcome to Chicago. So uh, my name is uh, Jim Fang, and my co-chair is Sean Penny. And we're here to help you pass a test in a couple of uh, months. This is the uh, HFSA-sponsored Heart Failure Transplant Board Review course. And thank you for attending. Uh, we're going to try to, uh, in the next uh, couple of days, cover the whole spectrum of heart failure transplant cardiology. And we're also going to be taking advantage, hopefully, of the latest in technology. So I'm assuming that most of you use smartphones, uh, probably the majority of you. And I would encourage you to use the smartphones for the uh, ARS system, the audience response system, to uh, answer some of the questions as we go through uh, the course. Uh, in general, most people uh, who come to a course like this want questions, uh, and I think questions are a great way to stimulate uh, your fund of knowledge, and it is, of course, the format by which the, the boards uh, ultimately test you. So please make sure you log on to this site uh, that's in your binders and let us know if it's not working. It should be relatively self-explanatory. You'll have 20 seconds to answer the questions. And then the um, answer, the audience comes to the conclusion um, for will show up on the screens and then we'll go through the answers. One of the things we thought we would do that's a little novel to our review course is we'd actually start off with questions, just doing questions for an hour. And I think it gets people sort of into the groove of uh, taking a test as well as sort of hopefully identifying gaps in knowledge or other things you might require. Now, I also suspect that most people in the room here have practiced the discipline of heart failure for some time, and so this is much of what you're going to hear over the next couple of days may not be new to you, but simply a refresher. Uh, also, feel free to ask questions. We're on a relatively tight schedule with the uh, lectures themselves, but we have, as you see in the um, agenda, given breaks of four uh, questions. And again, we're going to use your smartphones as a way to uh, send us questions that you want us to answer. So in the spirit of staying on time, what we're going to do is alternate between myself and Sean uh, in terms of tackling questions. So we'll just get right into this. So here's the first question. A 60-year-old man is referred for assessment of heart failure risk. He's been treated for both hypertension and diabetes for many years, but has no heart failure symptoms. He underwent a cabbage coronary bypass surgery nearly eight years ago. His exam reveals a normal blood pressure, no jugular venous distension, clear lungs, a cardiac apex in the anterior axillary line, and warm extremities without edema. So the question is, in addition to a comprehensive history and physical, his initial evaluation should include an ECG, an echo, a chest X-ray, and ECG, chest X-ray, uh, ECG, and echo, a chest X-ray, ECG, and an exercise test. So if you could go ahead and use your smartphones to answer this. You have 20 seconds. Now we're going to try to get through, what, we th 18 questions this morning? Because yeah, we got an hour, so it leaves us roughly about three or four minutes a question. Elizabeth, is there Elizabeth here? Yes, so you can help us with this, right, if we have issues. Elizabeth in the, in the back of the room is our IT guru and will be able to help with this. What's that? Oh, I have to progress the slide? Okay. Oh, there you go. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was just testing you, Elizabeth. Well, it'd be great to have music, but I guess that's... Yeah, it's too early. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. That is the answer that uh, we think the boards would be looking for. A couple of comments. You know, you, uh, for those, everybody here has been in practice some time, and doing any one of these things arguably wouldn't be wrong. Uh, and in fact, there's a literature out there that if the physical exam is normal, the EKG is normal, and the chest X ray is normal, the likelihood an echo is going to show you much is, is, is quite low. But despite that literature, this is what's really recommended by the guidelines. And that, that's one of the big messages of today is that in general for these board exams, whether you're doing general cardiology boards, interventional boards, heart failure boards, is that they heavily rely on the published guidelines. 
and you should really commit to memory class one and class three recommendations. So much of what we do is class two. We will talk about some class two recommendations as the uh, couple of days go, but uh, in general, um, because at least there's consensus that class one and class three um, are important, uh, I would commit those to memory. All right, you wanna take the next question? Great, thanks Jim. Maybe you have control on the slides? Yeah. I'm clicking, Elizabeth. All right, question two. A 56-year-old woman is sent to you for consultation after having presented with heart failure symptoms and an echocardiogram demonstrating a dilated left ventricle with an EF 35% and diffuse hypokinesis. The primary physician ordered a cardiac MR study, which you have examined. The most likely interpretation of the scenario is a, she had a large lateral wall myocardial infarction with subsequent remodeling. B, she has normal coronary arteries. C, she has cardiac amyloid. And D, she has extensive hibernating myocardium. So here's the image, cardiac MRI. I'll give you a minute to take a look at this. I, I will tell you, having taken the boards, the images are actually fairly good. They're up on a computer screen, and you should have pretty good resolution. Some of them are moving images, like with uh, echocardiogram. The MR images that were there on the, um, on the boards were, were very uh, detailed. So look at the, the key feature that jumps out at you, and we'll move on to the questions. So go ahead and vote. And then after we see the, uh, the correct answer, I'll see if we can go back to the image just to link the two together. <clears throat> yeah, good. So uh, almost 60% got the right answer, which is that she has normal coronary arteries. So here's what they're, they're looking at. So you can see mid-myocardial or sub-epicardial hyper-enhancement. You can see that very well in the um, image to your right. And it's also circumferential, so it doesn't fit a pattern of a, of a, it doesn't fit an anatomic pattern. The other thing is that uh, you don't see LV wall thickness that you would see with cardiac amyloidosis. And this is not the pattern that you would see with a myocardial infarction, which usually is subendocardial extending to mid wall. Any questions about that? All right, question three. A 50-year-old man presents with months of fatigue and dyspnea. The echo shows an EF of 20% and diastolic dimension of seven centimeters. Moderately severe MR and normal RV function. Has had frequent non-sustained VT. His blood pressure is 95 over 68 with limited medical management. The most appropriate next intervention is dobutamine, milrinone, digoxin, nipride, or a balloon pump. These are the hemodynamics with their waveforms. Here's other data you might be interested in. Okay, I'll give a few minutes for you to digest all of that. You saw all the options. All right. Everybody got a handle on how sick this person is? All right, 20 seconds. What are you going to do? These are your choices. The silence is deafening. <laughs> <laughs> Still early. I guess this is how the real boards work. So the majority of you said uh, nitroprusside, and that is the correct answer. The boards love this kind of stuff. We're going to talk more about hemodynamics this afternoon, but the key feature here is what? Yeah, the high SVR. <clears throat> For many of you who work with uh, cath labs, you know, it, it's often a number that's not often told to you when they call you from the cath lab, but frankly, it's one of the uh, most important targets, as we'll talk about, in the management of heart failure and why vasodilation it really forms a cornerstone of what we do. Now, unfortunately, in many patients that we will see will be faced with the low index, low SVR patient, and, and that is, uh, frankly, a lethal hemodynamic uh, pattern. But anytime you see a low index in the setting of a uh, elevated SVR, the target really should be SVR. 
Is it wrong to use inotropes here? Well, probably not wrong, but uh, the patient's already having a lot of ectopy, right? That's unlikely to get better with more inotropes. Certainly a balloon pump is one way to decrease uh, aortic impedance and uh, uh, resistance, but that uh, is an invasive procedure, and if NIPRI gets the same job done, I think it would be preferable. And then uh, we can talk maybe at a later time whether anybody really believes in loading with IV dig anymore, uh, which was one of the options. So any questions about that? Yeah, so in, again, in, tr in terms of inotropic therapy, uh, in general, at least for the purposes of the boards, I want you to make sure that you understand how important vasodilation is to low output syndromes when there's a high SVR. You could use milrinone. Milrinone, everybody knows, is essentially dobutamine plus nipride. But again, in the patient with a lot of ectopy, right? Uh, and we know that when you add an inotrope to decompensate a heart failure, you're essentially adding gas to the fire because it is, of course, an adrenergic agent. And again, with the SVR almost 2,000 here, this would be a relatively easy target. The hypotension should not bother you, by the way. So, all right, we better move on. Which of the following pairs of condition represent the highest population attributable risk for developing heart failure? A, diabetes and obesity. B, smoking and chronic kidney disease. C, hypertension and coronary artery disease. D, valvular heart disease and left ventricular hypertrophy, or E, peripheral vascular disease and hypothyroidism. So if you could advance the slide for me, Jim, thanks. So all of these contribute in, in some way, so which one is the highest population attributable risk? <clears throat> Yeah, great. So 82% got it right, hypertension and coronary artery disease. Can't say enough about the risk factor of hypertension in terms of the development of, of heart failure, both heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and heart failure preserved ejection fraction. If you look at a population, it is the one risk factor which is most prevalent and therefore is probably the most important contributor to heart failure. However, if you look at the hazard ratio for developing heart failure, the one that is the, has the highest hazard ratio <laughs> is coronary artery disease, and specifically coronary heart disease. So patients who have suffered myocardial infarction are much more likely to experience heart failure down the road. Any thoughts or questions about that? All right. All right, the following hemodynamics are most suggestive of, and I'll show you these in just a moment, constriction, restriction, dilated cardiomyopathy, or a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Take a gander at these, right atrial pressure in the upper left, RV pressure upper right, the PA pressure lower left, and the uh, filling pressures on the lower right. So you're not only given the, ex the values in the upper left-hand corner of each panel, but you have see the waveforms, which again is a emphasis to the boards. It's not just about the numbers, it's about the pictures. And this is the last picture where you have simultaneous RV and LV. And this is actually taken from a patient of mine. So uh, I could tell you the definitive diagnosis. All right, so constriction, restriction, dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Fantastic, the majority of you got this right. So, you know, this is, I uh, <laughs> can't tell you how many boards love uh, trying to get you to understand the distinction between constriction and restriction. It seems to be a question that comes up uh, all the time. Many of you know that there have been criteria that have been worked out for years. Probably the most familiar one to all of you is equalization of the end diastolic pressures. Turns out that that's actually not a very good sign. Uh, when you really put it to the test. You can also look for uh, things like, um, particularly in pulmonary hypertension, uh, you're gonna see that more commonly with restriction than with constriction. Um, but the key feature, of course, is this, which is the interventricular dependence. And what do you guys see here with inspiration? You see a dissociation, right, 
of the RC, RV systolic pressure from the LV systolic pressure. So when, the, when you inspire, because of the increase in venous return, you're going to see an increase in the RV systolic pressure. But because of intraventricular dependence, it's going to affect the stroke volume on the left side, which is going to decrease, therefore, the systolic pressure um, of the LV. And so you see this classic dissociative pattern. And this is uh, the best test. Now, of course, this is based upon a paper in 1996 by Harrell, which is a patient for those of you, for, it's a paper for those of you who remember, is a study of 15 patients. <laughs> Cardiology, that's a abstract. Um, but when it's constriction, it makes it into circulation uh, in 1996, uh, down at the Mayo Clinic. And all of these patients went on to have surgically uh, confirmed constriction. Any questions about that? All right. Question six. You see an 83-year-old man who has not seen a doctor in 30 years. He comes to your clinic at the insistence of his daughter. He is asymptomatic and active. On exam, his blood pressure is 164 over 96. Rest of the exam is unremarkable. ECG is normal. Laboratory tests are only remarkable for creatinine of 1.4. Hypertension management in the elderly can be expected to which of the following to stroke rate, heart failure rate, and mortality. I have to say that's the one thing I hate about the boards. You read this huge stem. <laughs> And then you get to the question, and you like, could have gotten that without the clinical background. But here are the, the responses. What does uh, hypertension control do in terms of stroke rate, heart failure rate, and mortality? Does it uh, have no effect? Does it decrease, or does it increase? So we'll open up the voting. <clears throat> oh, can you advance one, Jim? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great. So it decreases the risk of stroke, it decreases the risk of heart failure, and it also decreases the risk of mortality. So we know this uh, primarily its effect on stroke, which is the strongest effect. We know that from the SHEP trial and others that controlling hypertension decreases the rate of stroke, particularly uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, but it also decreases the risk of developing heart failure, uh, including heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. And the combined effect then is also to decrease the risk of mortality. And again, hypertension is highly testable. You'll see it throughout the boards. <clears throat> All right, question seven. I saw Dan Burkhoff walk in, so this is right of his uh, talk, and he'll go into this much more detail. Um, when LV function is depicted by a pressure volume loop, the slope of the end systolic pressure volume relationship, also known as end systolic elastance, is increased, and we'll show you the image. And the uh, two curves uh, going from A to B represent uh, the impact of a vasodilator, an anotropic agent, a lucitropic agent, an increase in the afterload or an increase in the end diastolic volume. This is the PV loop. All right, so what happened when you went from A to B? Vasodilator, inotrope, lucitrope, increase in afterload or an increase in the end diastolic volume. PV loops are also highly testable on the boards. Yeah, a positive inotropic agent. So this is a reflection of the instastolic elastance, and you can see that for any increase in the diastolic volume, you're going to get a greater increase in instastolic pressure, which is a reflection of contractility. The slope of this line, uh, the flatter, the, the decrease in, uh, in contractility and the steeper, um, the uh, greater the contractility. And this is a, uh, perhaps one of the best ways to look at uh, load independence of contractility. All right, and again, Don, Dan Burkhoff is gonna spend an hour with you going over uh, the finer points of PV loop, so I won't belabor this, but most of you are probably are familiar with this. Okay, question eight. 42-year-old woman presents for evaluation of progressive angina and dyspnea on exertion. She has no prior cardiac history other than a long-standing murmur. 
no cardiovascular risk factors, blood pressure is 112 over 70, heart rate 86, normal jugular venous pressure, brisk carotid upstrokes without bruise and clear lungs, normal S1, S2 with an S4 gallop, she has a two out of six late peaking systolic ejection murmur. There's no change with the strain phase of Valsalva. Her chest X-ray shows a mild increase in pulmonary vascularity with a normal heart size. Her EKG echo and continuous wave Doppler obtained from the apical position are shown below. I'll give you a minute or so to look at those three items. So question, which is the best choice as the next step for this patient? Isosorbide mononitrate, aortic valve replacement, metoprolol 25 milligrams twice daily, discussion about an ICD, or surgical septal my myectomy. I'll go to the voting screen. <clears throat> Yeah, excellent. So obviously this woman has a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, highly, highly, highly testable on the boards. And uh, the treatment, of course, is going to be uh, metoprolol 25 milligrams twice a day as a, a negative uh, uh, inotrope. So there's a lot packed into this question. So not only do you have to make the proper diagnosis, but then you also have to know the, the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the clues to the diagnosis, um, young woman with a systolic ejection murmur, it's late peaking, not early or mid peaking. She doesn't have any change in the murmur with the strain phase of Valsalva, but probably does with the relaxation phase of Valsalva when there's vasodilation, which will increase the gradient. The echocardiogram showed clear septal hypertrophy. The EKG had high voltage. And the uh, echo showed that classic dagger sign suggestive of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So of the other treatment options here, you saw a discussion about an ICD. Um, it's certainly appropriate to have a discussion about ICD, and we will be sure to cover the indications for ICD, which at least in the stem, she didn't have any, no history of sudden cardiac death, resuscitated death, drop in blood pressure, family history of sudden cardiac death, et cetera. And surgical septal myectomy would not be the first uh, treatment of choice. You're going to start with medications and reserve those interventional therapies for patients with refractory symptoms. Any questions about that? Right on right. time. How's the pace? Is this reasonable? I'm not going too fast, too slow, boring you? <laughs> All right. Uh, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, also for the boards, keep in mind that, uh, particularly as a heart failure doctor, you should think about mimics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, of course, one of the favorites is what? Amyloid. Okay. You should also think about other causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Anybody heard of Febreze disease? That's a common testable question. Uh, the classic is you'll have a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, acroparesthesias, right? Pompe's disease. So you should think about some of these other mimickers because this is, again, highly testable. As a heart failure expert, particularly in contrast to general cardiology, you should, be a ha you should have a relatively large differential diagnosis for a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and not just familial HCM. All right, question nine. 57-year-old woman with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and a, histamine, and a history of intermittent AV block received a dual chamber pacemaker six years ago. She gradually developed symptoms of heart failure and two weeks ago was upgraded to a CRTD device at the time of generator change, which is the first ECG. And then she comes back, um, doesn't feel any better, and uh, you get another EKG in the office. These are your two EKGs. This is the EKG right after her procedure. Give you a second or two to digest that. And this is two weeks later, and she says she doesn't feel any better. So everybody got that. So which of the following is most likely to have occurred? Somewhere along the way, she developed a flutter. B, her RV lead dislodged. C, her LV lead dislodged. There's been a perforation, or she has PMT.
Oh, fantastic. Um, most of you recognize that this is uh, representative of uh, LV Elite Dislodgement. And uh, anybody want to point out why? Yeah, loss of the R wave, right? So, you know, whenever you have anybody in the office with resynchronization, you should look for two things. Uh, if they are having uh, uh, appropriate resynchronization, you should see an R wave, of course, uh, because you're given a functional right bundle in lead V1, and of course, you should get a what? Rightward axis, right? So those are the two things you look for. So I always look for this in an EKG whenever I see anybody who's had CRT. I always look at the chest X-ray as well because we know apical placement of a CRT lead, which is not uncommon actually in clinical practice, will make patients worse. So those are the three things I look for when I'm looking for the adequacy of CRT. One, a rightward axis. Two, an R wave in V1. And three, a chest X-ray that does show the LV lead not at the apex. All right? All right. Okay, moving on to question 10. A 58-year-old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction 26%, hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure, his third such emission in the past six months. Medications include aspirin, warfarin, furosemide, carvedilol, lisinopril, spironolactone, and atorvastatin. Physical exam, heart rate's 110 and a regular, blood pressure 180 over 90. Neck, the jugular venous pressure is 15 centimeters of water. Lungs have crackles over two-thirds of both lung fields. The heart has an S3 gallop with a three over six holosystolic murmur at the apex. The abdomen shows uh, mild hepatomegaly and the extremities have three plus pitting edema. Labs show a troponin I of 0 0.54, a BNP of 1500 and a creatinine of 1.8. EKG shows atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response and a left bundle branch block, no change from before. If you could advance for me, Jim. Oh, sorry. Thanks. So based on these findings and large-scale evaluations of patients admitted with acute heart failure, the most likely cause of this patient's current episode of decompensated heart failure is A, iatrogenic, including use of inappropriate medications and comorbidities, B, atrial fibrillation with inadequate rate control, C, hypertensive urgency, D, non-adherence to medications or diet, or E, progressive LV dilatation with worsening mitral regurgitation. So if you go one more for me. Thanks. I'm embarrassed to keep reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this will definitely be on the boards about the uh, triggers for decompensated heart failure. Okay, good. The majority of you got this right, non-adherence to, to medications or diet. So we know this from the ADHERE data set, over 100,000 patients admitted with decompensated heart failure. Lots of things can trigger decompensated heart failure. Among them are non-adherence to medications, uh, one of the big ones. And there were some clues to this. I mean, uh, onset of uh, atrial fibrillation or rapid atrial fibrillation would certainly be a cause for decompensated heart failure. But the clue in the stem was the fact that he was on warfarin and he was on a, a good dose of a beta blocker, which should slow the heart rate, a clue that maybe he was not taking his medications. Other things that you should know of for triggers of decompensated heart failure, coincident infection, we didn't hear anything about that in the, in the stem. Um, acute coronary syndrome, probably one of the, the strongest ones that can drive decompensated heart failure. The troponin was only minimally elevated and probably in the setting of decompensation. And then also uh, um, uh, arrhythmias besides atrial fibrillation also runs of uh, ventricular tachycardia, which we didn't hear about in this case. So we, the, the other clue was the fact that not only was he tachycardic, but there was probably a rebound in hypertension because he wasn't taking his medicines. So that was the clue in the stem. Any questions about triggers? Okay, great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Jim. If we can just go back to either the, the gotcha. images or the stem so yeah. we can see the choices again. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, so. we'll do that. All right. Yeah, on the boards, by the way, there are a lot of these sort of stems. That's, there's... Having taken the boards myself, uh, I could tell you there are there's you know uh, there's not a in, uh, inconsequential amount of just uh, raw knowledge, but 70, 80 percent of the questions are really these stems. So get used to reading these, and they really try to bury the important stuff within the stem. 
All right, which of the following is associated with an increase in myocardial contractility? For example, this kind of question, <laughs> which is pure just knowledge-based. There's no clinical application uh, to this at the bedside. Um, a decrease in myofilament calcium sensitivity, a decrease in intracellular sodium concentration, uh, a decrease in intracellular calcium concentration, inhibition of phospholamban, and inhibition of circa. This is just a straightforward knowledge base if you understand the mechanisms of contractility at a cellular and basic level. And again, Dan Burkhoff's going to go into this in much greater detail in about an hour. Good. So the majority of you understood that this was uh, an issue of phospholamban. Phospholamban, anybody remember what that protein does? It's essentially a circa break. Uh, and it tonically inhibits circa. And circa is important. Why? Because it moves calcium from the cytosol uh, into the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And contractility is all about calcium transients, all about how much calcium you can get into the cytosol and out of it. It's called the calcium transient. And the ways by which calcium gets in and out of the cell there are obviously via the membrane of the cell, but also the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And by taking off this break, when it's phosphorylated, you increase the ability of circa to get calcium out of the cytosol into the circa, which then uh, allows um, uh, potentiation of um, uh, contractility. Okay. And it's a mechanism by which, by the way, inotropes work, many inotropes through beta adrenergic activation. Okay? So I was just looking through some of the, the questions that you have um, sent to, to Jim and me. So thank you for sending those. There was one about the, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy question that we went over. Someone very astutely pointed out that the septum looked like it might have been more than three centimeters. So I was going back and looking. It's probably pretty close to three centimeters. So we will make sure that we cover that. I think Barry Borlaug is going over hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for us, and he'll go over the indications for uh, putting in a, a defibrillator. And so a septum over three would be uh, an indication, one of five indications for putting in an ICD to prevent sudden cardiac death. So good pickup. I would still say that the, the next best um, step would still be to start a beta blocker but it is uh, the next step after that would be to have a conversation about uh, implanting a defibrillator for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death, and then also uh, going back and re-interviewing that patient to see if there are any clues about risk factors for sudden cardiac death. I think in the stem, the patient was symptomatic too, right? In the stem? Yeah, she was yeah. symptomatic. Yeah, so uh, that was also, I think, an important feature of the question is that she was having symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So an ICD is not going to make her feel better. Good point. Okay. All right, 12. Question 12. A 39-year-old man is referred for progressive exertional dyspnea. He has no history of hypertension or smoking and no other risk factors for coronary disease. Examination is unremarkable. Echo shows normal left ventricular size, ejection fraction 62%, concentrically increased LV wall thickness, normal left atrial size, small effusion, mitral inflow pattern shows... So you don't really get a good look at the LV, but you do see the mitral inflow pattern. Okay. And this is his EKG. So the patient is treated as an outpatient with Lasix, 80 milligrams twice a day. It begins dexamethasone and melphalan. You see this patient one week later in the hospital after admission for an acute decompensation. He has pulmonary edema. His heart rate is 100. Blood pressure is 138 over 84. The next best step would be to add ultrafiltration, beta blocker, enalapril, diltiazem, or IV furosemide, 160 milligrams a day. And the voting page. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Okay, good. So the majority of you chose to treat with uh, IV LASIK. So again, another question where you get to the end of it and like, okay, good, we know it's cardiac amyloid. And then you realize, oh, that's not the answer. I now have to manage it too. So let's talk about the last part first. So um, this person's decompensated. So what you want to do is to treat with IV furosemide. And using the example from the dose trial, you want to give your initial dose of IV furosemide should equal the total daily dose given, or at least the total daily dose given uh, intravenously. So that would be at least 160 milligrams IV as an upfront uh, first dose. Then what are the clues to this person having amyloid? Well, you had a disconnect, right? You had a restrictive filling pattern, um, some evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, and yet you have an EKG that shows low voltage and a pseudo-infarct pattern in the uh, anterior leads, all clues that this is cardiac amyloidosis. Any questions about that? For the purposes of the boards, there will be half, half questions, and this is a uh, important diagnosis to make when you see a patient with HEFPEF, so keep that in mind. Uh, the STEM may include somebody w without hypertension, very bad right heart failure, and a very elevated BNP. That is amyloid and HEFPEF until proven otherwise, okay? Very, very elevated BNP, which typically we don't see very large elevations in BNP with HEFPEF, very bad right heart failure, and no history of hypertension, all right? Think about amyloid when you are given a HEFPEF stem. We're doing really well for time. Uh, I think our first speaker's not until 10, right? So we're gonna try to get you a break around uh, 9.40, 9.45. Any questions about that? Okay, uh, you are asked to consult on a female patient whose blood pressure is difficult to control, BMI is 31. She denies having problems sleeping. You optimize her antihypertensive therapy, but her blood pressure continues to fluctuate. You order a sleep test. The apnea hypopnea index is 25. Pulse ox during sleep is 88%. Which of the following is the next best step? CPAP and weight loss. Counsel the patient for weight loss first. Initiate CPAP, ignoring weight. Nasal kenya oxygen. I figured most people would get this. Uh, as everybody recognized, sleep disorder breathing affects roughly 50% of our patients, even patients who are compensated. Uh, we showed that a number of years ago, that even on optimal medical therapy is very common. I think one of the only issues that I take issue with this question is how much of it is central and how much of it is obstructive. Uh, the current definition is um, which is the predominant pattern, e.g., more than 50%. So if more than 50% of the apneas are central, this would be considered central sleep apnea, also familiar, also otherwise known as chain Stokes respirations. If more than 50% are obstructive, it's obstruction. And this is a relevant point because does CPAP help central sleep apnea? No, in fact, there's actually, a, there's actually reasonable cause for concern that it's harmful. Uh, even assisted servoventilation uh, does not appear to help. So it's important as a heart failure specialist that you look at the sleep report a little bit more detailed than simply just what the AHI is. Uh, it's very important to know that because if it's more, again, than 50% central, then CPAP really is of little benefit. And probably the best therapy for that is just nocturnal oxygen. All right. If the majority of it is obstructive, then, then we're talking about CPAP. You can anticipate, if it's primarily obstructive, an improvement of ejection fraction by about 5 or 10 percentage points in the literature with the use of CPAP support on optimal medical therapy. So you can get a little bit more bang for your buck if you can treat it. Of course, the issue is tolerance. Uh, it's a huge issue. There are CPAP habituation clinics in many communities. 
I'm a big fan of those because the number of uh, appliances out there now have really grown astronomically. So it's not all the football helmet uh, to bed. There are better techniques and, and instruments to use. All right. Okay, question 14. A 65-year-old man is scheduled for elective open AAA surgery. He has a history of a dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure and is clinically well compensated on ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. EF was 35% four months ago on echo. His most recent serum creatinine was 1.72. Appropriate management would include A, taper the beta blocker to avoid negative inotropic effect during anesthesia induction. B, hold the ACE inhibitor and beta blocker on the morning of surgery. C, continue all medications, repeat the echo. D, continue all medications, move on to surgery. E, recommend exercise stress test for risk stratification prior to surgery. Yeah, great. Continue all medications and move on to surgery. So the, the boards, uh, I guess this isn't really boardsmanship, but you should know how the boards are written. The boards are written with one teaching point in mind. And so all of the information, all of the clues in the STEM will drive you to that one teaching point. So when you read a question like this, you have to kind of ask yourself, well, what is the teaching point? Is it, you know, how do you clear someone for cardiac surgery in the setting of heart failure? Or is it something else? And in this case, I think what they're really doing is the, the question writer is reflecting back to the guidelines, which emphasizes to all of us that you want to continue neurohormonal antagonists as much as possible during an inpatient stay. In this particular individual, he was well compensated from a heart failure viewpoint and should continue on those um, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers through the, the surgery and through the hospitalization. So the default position should be to continue those medicines uh, for as long as possible during a, a heart failure stay. And that also underscores the, the reality that if you discontinue a medicine in the, in the hospital and the patient leaves without that medication, odds are that they're not going to be taking it long term. So that transitional piece from inpatient stay to outpatient stay is, is critical. It will certainly be a, a, a testing point on the boards. In this case, I'm just out of curiosity, how many of, your, how many of you would have stopped the ACE inhibitor? Couple hands go up, a couple brave hands. Yeah, there's no way our surgeons would have operated on this guy on an ACE inhibitor because of the, the theoretical risk of, of vasoplegia. But fortunately, the way that the, the stem was structured, it was linked to the beta blocker, which you would want to uh, continue throughout the time of surgery. Go. Fantastic. Also, just looking at the questions here, what the most popular question you have for us, by the way, everybody happy with how this app is working? It's actually working. I'm very impressed. Thank you, Elizabeth. So uh, the, the, the question that's getting a lot of uh, play here is how many formulas EF, ECHO, 4, MR will be on the boards? Uh, um, so there's not going to be a lot of formulas per se for um, uh, MR assessment. You should be able, though, to recognize the different quantifications for MR. Uh, ERO uh, is a very... Uh, common one that's off, uh, you'll just need to know what the values are. Because the management of MR is so controversial in a heart failure, you are unlikely to be asked, you know, what is the best way to treat the MR? Um, there's no doubt that medical therapy and CRT is what we always start with. The one other point about MR that you may be asked about the boards, um, which I recall from the boards, is that you should uh, be able to articulate the differences between uh, functional and organic. Because in clinical practice, that is the question. Even if there's severe LV dysfunction, if the MR is organic, uh, the recommendation would be to fix it, even with significant LV dysfunction. On the other hand, if the MR is not organic and functional, much more controversial. Okay, does that help? But they're not gonna be, you're not going to be asked to calculate the severity of MR for the boards. There are, there are a few things that you will be asked to calculate. So I remember having to calculate the right ventricular stroke work index, and they gave you five sets of hemodynamics, and so the, what they were driving at was how bad was the RV, and the only way you could do that was by the RV stroke work index, so you had to get out pencil and paper and calculate it. And 
Fortunately, they, the numbers were even so that you could do it in your head, but I do remember that that was one formula that you should probably file away that you maybe Yeah, we'll go over hemodynamics, and you will definitely should know some of these formulas for the hemodynamics. All right, question 15. Which of the following arrhythmias is most common during late follow-up in orthotopic cardiac transplant recipients? Sustained monomorphic VT, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, AV nodal reentry tachycardia, bidirectional VT. This is so cool, you can actually see the answers in real time. Oh, we have a dead tie. <laughs> <laughs> so just a show of hands, uh, how many in the audience uh, practice in their daily life transplant cardiology? Wow. So, wow, a, a fair number of you. Um, so that means the others of you uh, probably don't do this routinely. This is a very good question, and probably why many of you are here is for the transplant MCS part um, of our discipline. Uh, first of all, arrhythmias are common or uncommon after heart transplantation? 50-50. <laughs> they're relatively uncommon. It's, they're very uncommon. Uh, arrhythmias are relatively uncommon. So whenever we see arrhythmias after heart transplantation, you worry about something going on. <laughs> okay. Uh, VT is very unusual. Um, there's an old literature about how AFib may presage um, rejection. Uh, that literature is actually, frankly, not that robust, but that is a, a classic teaching. Um, one of the most important arrhythmias we see late after transplantation is actually bradyarrhythmias. So an uncommonly causes a syncope late after transplantation is due to unrecognized or undocumented uh, sinus arrest. But in terms of these arrhythmias, um, it's really atrial flutter, and a lot of this has to do with the nature of the anastomosis. It is not typical flutter, so it is not typically esthmus dependent, all right? It's usually left atrial flutter. And again, uh, if you're doing a biatrial anastomosis, this is what you're gonna see. We don't see this that often anymore because in modern cardiac surgery, uh, nobody does the old Shumway technique or biatrial anastomosis, it's almost always by cable, so we don't typically have this problem. But uh, for those of you who take care of patients who are uh, a couple of decades out from their transplant, you may see this. Okay. Uh-oh. What did I do, yep, Elizabeth? That's right. Question 16. How come I... Did you lose your screen? Did I? No, you're well, good. Go ahead. Yep, is it, is it on your screen? Yep. Okay. So one of your heart failure patients has the following cardiopulmonary stress test performed. The patient should be listed for transplant because. So let's advance one, Jim. Let's put the CPAP yeah, up there. Sorry. So take a look at the uh, gas exchange information. And then VO2 of 7.9, VO2 per heart rate of 8, a heart rate of 87, and a VE VCO2 slope of 31. All right, so we can go to the question. So this patient should be listed for transplant because A, is oxygen uptake is low and anaerobic threshold achieved. B, is oxygen uptake plateaus and represents max VO2. Is poor ventilatory efficiency is associated with increased mortality or he should not be listed. Oh, good, okay. So he should not be listed for transplant. That's the right answer. So. He, there are a couple things here. So you're going to need to know about um, VO2. You're also going to need to know what represents a maximal test and crossing the anaerobic threshold. And then also some of the other indicators for um, higher risk that would justify listing for transplant, including the VE VCO2 slope. So a VE VCO2 slope greater than 35 would be uh, one indication. Uh, a peak VO2 less than 14 uh, or less than 12. Um, some would say less than 10 for patients who are, are women taking beta blockers. Um, but the clue here that the reason this individual should not be listed for transplant is the fact that this individual does not cross the anaerobic threshold. If you look at uh, 
the uh, VO2 versus the um, CO2, you'll see that they do not cross. And that's the clue that they do not uh, reach the anaerobic threshold. So one would not list because this was a submaximal test. The other, the other teaching point here is that you would never make a decision about listing for transplant solely on the basis of a cardiopulmonary stress test. Cardiopulmonary stress testing would be one component of an overall assessment for listing for heart transplantation. So two clues there. This kind of stuff is, again, highly testable. For those of you who do a lot of this, this is intuitive. But uh, for those of you who don't see a lot of these, uh, I uh, urge you to um, spend some time on this kind of stuff. There are some, a number of features here that do portend a poor prognosis. So the low VO2, independent of whether you reach the anaerobic threshold or not, is a poor prognostic sign. You should see the um, O2 pulse there is also very small, less than 10. There, there are features on this cardiopulmonary exercise test that do not spell well, but again, you're not going to list somebody for transplant just on the basis of the test. Okay, 17. A 77 year old woman with severe aortic stenosis. You see the valve area there, the mean gradient, and the ejection fraction is hospitalized for progressive heart failure. The patient has been offered AVR in the past but has refused. There are a number of comorbidities, uh, including the advanced CKD. There's the litany of medications. She's widowed, lives alone but has strong family support. On exam, she's frail, uh, clearly short of breath, um, appears intact but depressed. Been on the tachycardic side, blood pressure is 140 over 70, and has the classic findings of aortic stenosis and heart failure. She gets better with diuretics. Aortic valve uh, replacement is discussed. She again chooses not to undergo surgery, stating that she is too old and just doesn't want surgery. Okay, by the way, there's no TAVR option here. <laughs> okay, I know what everybody's thinking in the room on the first sentence, right? You're not going to be tested on TAVR. Uh, which of the following management options is the most appropriate? Request a psychiatry consult because you're concerned about depression, seek an ethics consult, palliative care, get the family to change your mind, initiate a DNR and discuss withdrawing support. I would tell you, these are really tough questions to write, and whether they're really testable or not is debatable. You're not going to see, I'll be the first one to admit, you're, you're going to see a tiny bit of this on the boards, and there's not going to be a lot of it. But I think most of people's intuitions would tell you what the right thing to do is. <laughs> so the idea here is not that she's crazy, <laughs> she doesn't want to have an AVR. She's probably, uh, well, she is, I think, right on base. The issue is, is, is recognizing the impact of depression. That is, remember, Sean talked about that these questions are written with one teaching point in mind. And depression has a huge impact in the management of heart failure. And that's what this question is trying to drive at. Not that she's crazy because she doesn't want surgery and you need to get a psychiatrist to show that. But have you really adequately addressed her depression is the issue here. Okay? Palliative care consultation is certainly not inappropriate. But I think in clinical practice, we often punt the question of depression to some, to call your primary care doctor, right? Yes. Absolutely. It's a very good point. Yeah, it's, it's really a global assessment. So again, that's really the point of this question. All right? Whether you think it was fair or not, as a question, <laughs> maybe debatable. It's that second part of, of each of those answers, right? With uh, consideration for hospice care. Yeah. I think that was what, you know. The other thing about question, so uh, from, away from, yeah. from two veterans of question writing committees. Well, you know, these questions are written, a couple things to keep in mind. This is good for you being a test taker, is that the questions, again, are meant to communicate one point and the answers usually are not going to give you an explanation of why the answer is incorrect or right. And the question is going to be written with something to do. 
You know, the rest of this, frankly, is for the commentary. So these, you know, in the mind of a question writer would be poor questions because you spend so much time explaining your answers. And then the other big thing is mixing therapeutic with diagnostic strategies because that decision to do another test versus do another therapy is so much dependent upon judgment. The boards generally will not do that. They'll give you all therapeutic options or all diagnostic options. They won't ask you to choose between the two. Okay. Question 18. A 62-year-old African-American man has referred to you as an outpatient because of heart failure with low ejection fraction for two years. Past history includes hypertension treated with, treated with valsartan, 80 milligrams twice daily, and atenolol, 50 milligrams once daily. He was previously treated with furosemide, subsequently stopped without sequelae. An ACE inhibitor was discontinued when he developed a cough. He has seen his internist only sporadically, and he has not previously followed the recommendation to see a cardiologist. He denies symptoms of dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain, lightheadedness, or syncope. He lives in a small town 50 miles away and has difficulty getting transportation, but came today because he got a ride. On exam, blood pressure is 150 over 90, heart rate 80 and regular, cardiac exam is normal. He has no signs of heart failure or fluid overload. Echocardiogram shows a moderately dilated left ventricle with an EF of 30%. ECG has normal sinus rhythm with occasional PVCs and left ventricular hypertrophy. In addition to education about sodium intake, which is the most appropriate next therapeutic step, A, switch from atenolol to a different beta blocker, B, switch from valsartan to an ACE inhibitor, C, initiate an aldosterone blocker, D, restart furosemide, and E, discuss the possibility of an ICD. It's a lot to read. <laughs> to your point, big stem, huh? Or yeah. maybe a short slide. You know, you'll, as you do more and more of these questions, you'll see that there's something that just doesn't quite fit there that might be a clue and that he just got a ride today. It doesn't really fit the tenor of most questions, so that's a clue. Okay, so switch from atenolol to a different beta blocker. Yeah, absolutely. So atenolol is not one of the beta blockers which is recommended for treatment of uh, systolic heart failure. One would be looking to use carvedilol or long-acting metoprolol or bisoprolol would be your three choices for that. Um, one would not use spironolactone in this case. I think that was one of the, the questions. Actually, that might be the next one, right? Is it? We've, this one continues, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so he's tolerating valsartan. You wouldn't switch back to the ACE inhibitor, even though, you know, in, in terms of prioritization, ACE inhibitors are considered to be better than angiotensin receptor blockers. So for people who um, are initiated on RAS blockade, it's appropriate to try an ACE inhibitor first and switch to an ARB if they are intolerant of ACE inhibition, which in this case he was because of the development of a cough. He's not congested, so you don't need to resume furosemide. And uh, ICD implant could be appropriate, but the first thing to do is to establish on guideline-directed medical therapy, then reassess ejection fraction. Any questions about that? So uh, why don't we actually handle a couple of the questions from the audience before we move on. Uh, Sean, do you want to handle... With creatinine being high, would it not be prudent? No, let's, uh, we talked a little bit about that. Oh, do you think questions about LCZ 696 mm -hmm. or if rabidine will be fair game? I can say unequivocally they will not be on the boards. Right. Okay, so do not worry about uh, Sacubitrol, Valsartan, or Evrabidine. They will not be on the boards. The examinations are written uh, a couple of years ahead of time, so you know none of this kind of stuff would make it to the boards. Now, on the other hand, all of you are heart failure experts, so I'm sure all of you are interested in our opinions. And we have the luxury of uh, having Clyde Yancey on our faculty um, who will specifically talk about Evrabidine and uh, LCZ-696. And I think his perspective will be very important since he is the lead author and chair of the guideline committee and was under tremendous uh, pressure, I think, in the past year to come out with a statement. So you're going to hear it from Clyde himself about uh, his perspective, and I think it'll be quite informative to all of you. Um, any other questions here? Do you want to? Yeah, I can, I can take uh, two from the bottom. So can you comment on the use of evabridine in heart transplant patients? Well, obviously, there's no data 
about use in heart transplant patients, but beyond that, um, one would suspect, uh, one would have to question why you would be using Evabradine in a heart transplant patient. It, it works on the IF channel, the funny channel, so one would expect it would slow heart rate even in the setting of a heart transplant, as opposed to maybe something like digitalis, which tends to slow heart rate due to its effect on increasing uh, parasympathetic tone. So maybe that was what you were driving at with that question. Yeah, in heart transplantation, as you know, we're all <clears throat> comfortable with a heart rate of 90 to 110. That's normal. Uh, it doesn't uh, require specific intervention. Uh, it, it just reflects the lack of vagal innervation. There is a literature, uh, and we're part of this, about you know, tachycardia contributing to the overall mortality, but it would be a big leap of faith to say bringing it down is going to have an impact. In fact, because the heart, and we'll talk about this during the heart transplant talks, because the heart is denervated, it's entirely reliant upon what? Circulating catecholamines for its performance. So this is why beta blockers in heart transplant patients are often very poorly tolerated. It's not wrong to use a beta blocker for hypertension control, but beta blockers generally are not very good antihypertensive agents and may exacerbate exertional intolerance in transplantation. Um, in, in fact, the rapidine therefore may actually be uh, detrimental. So another question, why no MRA for the African-American case? So according to the guidelines, it would certainly be appropriate to use uh, an aldosterone blocker in this case once established on appropriate beta blocker and appropriate RAS antagonist. The reason why um, that was not the correct answer in that particular stem had to do with his compliance. There was concern that he wasn't keeping his appointments. It was difficult to return to the office. Therefore, because one would have to check creatinine and potassium after starting an aldosterone antagonist, he would not be the, the most appropriate patient for that therapy. On the other hand, a combination of isosorbide dinitrate and hydralazine would be appropriate after getting established on uh, the appropriate beta blocker and RAS antagonist. That issue with MRAs um, are important one not only for clinical practice but for the boards. Keep in mind that every MRA trial has been done with very rigorous outpatient surveillance. Okay, it's not you put somebody on a little Spiro and say, I'll see you in a year. In all of the trials, laboratory surveillance was quite intense. Um, and everybody knows the data about uh, after the introduction of the spironolactone trial, there were more emergency room visits for hyperkalemia. So it is a testable concept that if you're going to put somebody on these agents, you have to make sure that you're comfortable with compliance, particularly with follow-up. Okay. Any more of these questions here? Yeah, there's a question about can, can we comment on salt restriction given the recent uh, publications? There was that recent publication, I think it was in Jack Heart Failure? Yeah. I think it was Jack Heart Failure um, about salt restriction that um, it may be harmful. Um, there are some methodological um, questions about that study. The point being not to discuss the study, but to say that it's a controversial area. And most things, most areas of controversy won't be tested by the boards because they are uh, controversial. And as Jim mentioned before, the things that are clearly testable are going to be any class one indication and any class three indication. So the things that you definitely need to do in every single case and the things that you should avoid in every single case. In the guidelines, it is recommended that sodium restriction um, be um, encouraged for all patients. Um, and I think it points to the fact that there is still a, a lack of evidence base around this, but it is in the guidelines. So it is part of standard therapy to recommend sodium restriction. It might come up on the boards, and it would be appropriate to say that sodium restriction is appropriate. But we do understand the controversy that surrounds that topic right now. Yeah, in fact, uh, how much of a sodium restriction is the obvious next question, and, and nobody knows the answer to that. <laughs> Often two to three grams is quoted, but uh, the evidence base for that is entirely based upon observation. Also, you should recognize that a lot of the salt data out there from observational studies is highly flawed because trying to assess sodium intake is very difficult. Uh, the best way, frankly, is a urinary collection. Um, and many of the studies, large epidemiologic studies, do not have urinary um, assessments of sodium excretion. So most of it's based upon dietary uh, information. And then one more question, I think, before we'll take a break here. Um, 
somebody pointed out that the stem said apnea hypoxia index. <laughs> You're right, it's apnea hypopnea uh, index. And um, was there one more? Oh, and somebody made the point that the palliative care consult, uh, they do address things like depression and et cetera. So. All right, any other questions before we take a short break? Our first speaker is going to be uh, Barry Greenberg. I haven't seen Barry, but uh, Barry is a friend and colleague, uh, a distinguished professor of medicine from the University of California, San Diego, and has uh, been involved in heart failure for many, many years, and I uh, really enjoy uh, looking forward to his remarks. All right? All right, it's time for a break. Thank you. <laughs> 